never felt that kind of sense of power when they sent me an email and asked me to pick my own introduction music. Uh, that was for all of you who are not from Sweden, that is uh, dance music, EDM, first generation. Uh, just going to make sure that my clicker is working. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> uh, I would just like to say thank you for being here. And thank you to Nordic Design for creating this awesome conference. Feels like you've gathered all the creative geniuses in one place. And then you brought me here. <clears throat> I'm here to talk about how we can gain insights into human behavior and doing so by using this thing called eye tracking. My name is Andreas, uh, and I work as a UX designer. <clears throat> I sometimes call myself a full stack UX designer because I'm usually the only guy in the team working with design. It turns out there's already another word for what I'm doing. So, <laughs> in my role as a lonely person talking, about, talking to the users, I'm kind of expected to both deliver research findings and turn them into design assets for the team. So doing so really requires me to spend my time well, wisely when it comes to user research and user testing. And I work at a company called Toby Pro. Uh, we build hardware and software solutions for uh, uh, understanding the human behavior with eye tracking. So before we begin this presentation, I also want to say that I'm here. I come in peace. I'm not here to sell you anything. Uh, I don't have any leftover summer deals or anything. I'm just here to talk and learn like most of us. So talking about eye tracking usually means talking about attention. And I get that because it's kind of an obvious thing that what you could do with our technology is to measure, me uh, measure where people are looking and what gets their attention. And competing for attention is an ongoing struggle for many of us. You might have heard that we live in this time called the attention economy. And some people even refer to this as the eyeball economy, which to me sounds a little bit intrusive. Uh, sounds like some kind of black market organ thing. Uh, at Toby Pro, we don't want to buy your eyeballs. We just want to me measure where they are looking. Uh, and we do so by using this thing called eye tracking. And competing for attention is pretty hard, and I've experienced that myself uh, on a personal level. You know, like most of you, I'm an Instagram user in my sixth year of using Instagram. <clears throat> I think that I have some pretty good content going on. <laughs> I think this is pretty funny. I even used the hashtag selfie as a joke <laughs> to kind of emphasize that I am in what we in Sweden call en skön uh, with self-distance. So I really dig my own content, so I keep on pushing for it over and over again without any real proof of uh, success. <clears throat> but the thing here is that this is kind of what we do on a business level too. Because even though we hear all these scary numbers about the attention economy, that you know, the average time spent on a website is 0 0.02 milliseconds before you do something else, or that there are like 57 billion new applications launched every day in the App Store, and that you really need to stand out in this attention economy. Even though we know that, and even though we live with all these technical innovations, what we do when it comes to competing for attention is using the same weapon of choice over and over again, and that is to scream as loud as we can. So, at Toby Pro, we found this interesting about, you know, measuring attention, and we got a panel of home users, so we gathered about 1,000 people, and we equipped them with eye trackers, and we tracked their browsing behavior at home. And uh, because we felt that, you know, online advertisement is kind of a hard thing to work in. It's hard to know if you get any return on investment on the money you spend. And studies show that more than half of our money we spend on online ads are without any return on investment. It's like putting them on a lottery. 
So we used our uh, home panel of more than 1,000 users and can attract if they could see the ads that were loaded onto the web pages. And it turned out that more than 80% of the ads that are loaded into the websites are never looked at. And as designers, this is also a problem because we're kind of perceived to believe that we really need to bloat our websites with, with ads in order to keep things rolling. We're perceived to believe that we need to create a bad user experience for the sake of financial issues. <clears throat> Turns out we're just creating a bad user experience. And it's not only a visual design thing, it's about performance as well as we you know, bloat our websites with the bad code that, you know, and we have banners jumping around and, and all that stuff. So it's definitely a uh, performance issue. So I really get that talking about attention is an important aspect of what we do. Because there are so many things going on around us. And there's so much noise. And even if we do our best to keep up with what's going on, we're just drowning in random messages, weird pop-ups, or disturbing sounds. And everywhere there's something calling for our attention, and it's just like this guy. You just stare around you, and we have no clue on what's going on. And you don't even seem to enjoy it. <clears throat> so from my perspective, I think attention is important, but to me it's only the entry point. What I'm interested in to learn more about is comprehension. Do our users still know what's going on? And are we giving them the sense of control? And the way that I see it is that attention is kind of the entry point, and action is the exit. Action, that's where we make our money. This is where people sign up for our forms, buy our stuff that we try to sell them. And as designers, you might have stakeholders who are so closely interested in the action part because the business is so closely tied to it. And they ask you, if we could just shrink the distance between attention and action just a little bit, it would make such a huge impact to our business. But the thing is that between attention and action is where we have comprehension. This is where we allow our users to still be in control and understand what's going on. So if you just design stuff to get to the action point as quickly as possible, then we do it on the uh, expense of control for our users. So we try to understand if people are getting what's going on, and we do that, this by doing user testing. And I think eye tracking can really be a good tool for that, because a lot of the things that we do on our devices today are like passively consuming things. It's like we're watching things or we're reading stuff. And there's no interaction going on between ourselves and the users, except for where we're looking. And that's why we do eye tracking. So eye tracking is this technology that allows us to measure where people are looking or how the eyes move in relation to the head. And studies of eye movement has been around for quite a while. In, I think, the 1800s, the user researchers of their time, probably using less fancy titles, they studied people uh, while they were reading books. So they would sit next to across another person who were reading books, at it, and they would just watch them and try to understand how the eyes moved. <clears throat> and the main thing that they found out was that Eyes don't move in this smooth path that you might think. Instead, uh, eye movement consisted of a series of short stops, and these stops are called fixations. And in user research, fixation is the main thing that we're interested in learning about, because this basically means that you find something interesting and you look at it. So this is kind of the heart of the eyeball economy. And the quick movement between each fixation is a, a rapid eye movement called a saccade. And saccades are a very funny thing because they're so fast. So when you, our eyes are moving, we actually don't have any visual presence. We're actually blind for a very short moment of time. And it's our brain who is patching things up for us. So it seems like we have 
visual presence all the time. And you can try this out uh, in the Fika break later if you just stand in front of a mirror and you look at yourself and you look at one of your eyes and then you look at your other eye and then you look at your first eye again. Then what you're doing is that you're doing a case between your own eyes and what you will discover is that you can never ever see your own eyes move. That's because you're blind for that very short time. <clears throat> and some of you might go, okay, hey, Mr. Lonely Guy, who's talking about comprehension. Uh, you know that, why aren't you telling me that you can still be aware of the surroundings without actively looking at it? And you're right, of course you can do that, just like this guy. He's using his peripheral vision to kind of grasp what's going on. But his attention is focused on something else. <laughs> his attention is focused on the Apple babysitter, usually called an iPad. Uh, so if you want to do user research with eye tracking, it's very important that you give your users a task to complete, because otherwise we're measuring attention, like our uh, advertisement panel project or my baby project. Uh, but if you would give this little guy a task to complete and say, hey, little guy, uh, eat, then it would look a little bit more like this. He's trying. Uh, so what we ask our users to do will mostly affect where they're looking at things. And this is because we have mental models on how things look. And what is important to remember if you want to do user research with eye tracking is that our mental models become very evident. You will discover that where, where what you will ask your participants to do or perform will affect how they look at things. Let's take this collection of uh, hipster milk replacement beverages. Uh, what is pretty evident here when you look at this picture is that they all pretty much look the same, right? This is what we designers call best practice. This is why we have the search bar in the top right corner. So if you want to do user research with eye tracking and you would ask your participants to go and look for a brand, for example, you would get a lot of eye tracking data in this region. But if you would ask them to find a certain flavor, they would start looking here instantly because they know that this is usually where you have the big graphics of your fruit or nut or whatever. And if you would ask them for nutrition facts, they would probably look somewhere here. And this is why you can't just go and say, hey, look at my eye tracking research. Isn't it good? You like it? Now please give me my $25,000. Uh, this, if you can't see, this is a box of crackers. And the only reason that I know that this is a box of crackers is because I made this presentation. It's kind of hard to see. So to explain a little bit, each color represents a different user and each circle represents a fixation. So this tells me that eye tracking is not a standalone solution for things. It's a tool. It's a powerful tool, but it's still a tool, you know? The way that you want to present your research is together with other methods, like interviews, for example. So instead of showing this to your stakeholder, you can say, hey, Mr. Goldfish, cracker owner, uh, I've made some eye tracking studies on your box and it turns out that you know the people who are interested in buying your product are the ones who look in a pattern that resembles this. So the people who are interested in buying this obviously don't look at the nutrition facts. And the biggest circle equals the longest fixations. So the people who are interested in buying this are really intrigued by the yellow fish. <laughs> Way to go, graphic designers. I keep on pushing for my content and my yellow fish. <clears throat> so the big question here and the selling point and the question that was being asked, you know, should I use eye tracking in my user research? And the answer to that question is, of course. 
maybe. I'm sorry, Toby Pro marketing team, who had such a high hopes for this presentation. I'm only here to tell you the truth. Because you shouldn't just do eye tracking for the sake of it to look cool or smart, because you won't. What you should do is be smart about your user research. You should do and use the tools that can get you from guessing to knowing and can get you there as cheap and quickly as possible. But there is one place where I found eye tracking to be really, really helpful, and that is to kind of create a natural environment for our users. And the way that I see user testing is something like this. This is a scale that I've come up with myself. Uh, I usually think of uh, user research or user testing as a trade-off between how easy it is to analyze something and natural behavior. So if we have our home panel that we're tracking while they are not watching ads online, then they are in their natural behavior because we don't ask them to do anything specific. We just passively track their eye movements. They know it, of course. Uh, but if we want things to be easy to analyze, then we have a really controlled environment. We have our fancy UX lab, and we bring out in our test participant, and we say, welcome, Mr. Test Participant. We are the jeans company. We are having you design for a website where you can buy jeans. Your task is to buy a pair of jeans. Please go ahead. And what your test participant will do is that they will click in the search bar in the top right corner because of best practice. And they will type in jeans, and they will select the first pair of jeans they find. They will place it in the add to cart and check out, and test is completed. And they can get out of there as soon as possible. And I think this, uh, to me, what we try to do is to create a more natural behavior because, you know, one reason for them wanting to complete the task as quickly as possible is because of our presence. And, you know, it's not only tough for them, it's tough for us as well because we might have been creating a design that we love so much and then you have this user who don't get it, you know? So that's kind of the hardest part about uh, user testing is this. You're right. That was really awkward. Uh, I, I didn't do it as a joke. I did it because of practice. The hardest part about user testing is being quiet while your users are not managing to do the things that you want them to do. Because it's hard. Being quiet and exposed is tough. It's hard being exposed here up on stage, being weirdly quiet for a while. But it's also hard if you created a design that you really, really love and you want your users to really be successful in the task that you're asking them to do. And the way that we approach this is to allow our users to do user testing in kind of any environment. And we track not only their screen, but also their eye movements. And the reason that we're tracking their eye movements is not only to learn about the issues they're having while performing the task. Eye tracking data and replaying that also serves them as a cue to remember the problems they were having. So if you want to do like a regular user testing, you usually ask your participants to kind of verbalize and talk about the issues they are having during the test. Uh, but what we do is that we track the uh, we record the test and they can be anywhere and then we can like uh, let them do the task that they do and then we can sit down with them afterwards to kind of discuss what was going on. So we try to remove ourselves from the equation a little bit. And this is something we call the retrospective think aloud where you allow your users to discuss later on 
what was going on during the test. I also think it's a powerful tool when you want to buy and boost from your unfriendly stakeholders. You know, showing a user test with eye tracking is a great way of building empathy for your users. Because it's not just, not just a screen recording, it's also a visualization that is highlighting the struggle that your users are having when trying to complete the task on their website. So we use eye tracking as a way to capture the user experience. It might be that you're designing a website where you need to understand what's going on when nothing's really going on from the user because they're having trouble. Or that you want to create an unboxing experience or a gaming experience, for example. Or you want to understand how it is to, f to drive a super fast car. Or you want to track the experience of the team who make things happen for you. So we believe that tracking the user experience can give you an extra depth of insights. And sometimes you're fine without them, but sometimes it's crucial. Like understanding the work experience for steel workers, for example. Now it's not only about creating a nice design for people, it's about safety. Or understand how you can provide, or understand how it is to work in the most important jobs in the world. like the medical industry, for example, and the surgeons. So what we try to do is to build tools for user testing any experience in any, in any design, in any environment. Because user experience is everywhere. So I just want to thank you for making it better. Thanks.